Jesus, when they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go in the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them uh, what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, and it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is God's good word for us, God's beloved people. Thanks be to God. Amen. So on our Disney trip, uh, Sydney brought back a lifesaver, uh, Thomas brought back a droid, and I brought back a wonderful case of COVID. Uh, but we got to go to all four of the parks. And most of the parks that are there makes sense to me. Uh, Magic Kingdom is the thing that Walt Disney fundamentally figured out that we all want theme parks to do. Um, you know, originally, uh, you know, a concept from the 1950s that we have been, he has been copying, he and then his company have been copying, pasting around the world. There's one in Anaheim, there's one in Orlando, there's one in Paris, there's one in Shanghai, there's one in Hong Kong, uh, there's one in Tokyo, and, and they all have, a, they call them castle parks for a reason. Castle at the center, things telling Disney stories and magical stories around it. Okay, you have Hollywood Studios, which is more or less like Universal Studios, the rival theme park, just done in a very Disney way. It's very pop culture focused, and so it has things that are more of the moment. This is where Star Wars lives. This is where Toy Story lives. Uh, this is where the Twilight Zone and Aerosmith live. <clears throat> okay, that all makes sense. And you've got Animal Kingdom, which is essentially uh, uh, Disney's take on a Bush Gardens. It is, what if a zoo also had, a zoo had all the educational stuff, and then also had some theme park rides. And then you come to Epcot. And Epcot fundamentally does not make sense. We were in Epcot on the first day, and uh, we had uh, been, uh, we were starting to walk around the part that is all different exhibits from nations around the world, and we go into the America exhibit, and we're listening to some acapella singers sing American show tunes while I am wandering through an exhibit of modern Native American art, and I had an epiphany. I'm at a theme park. What am I doing? Epcot doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because it's the holdover from a vision that never came to pass. When Disney bought, when Walt Disney bought up the 27,000 acres or two Manhattans uh, worth of land in central Florida, uh, southwest of Orlando, he did not think he was building a home to theme parks and resorts. He believed that he was going to construct the city of the future. Specifically, he was going to construct experimental prototype community of the future. Community of Tomorrow, or Epcot. The whole idea was that Magic Kingdom would be the entertainment district for experimental prototype community of tomorrow. And there would be an industrial area, and there would be a residential area, and there would be restaurants themed after many nations of the world. See, this is starting to connect. And that you would get around via monorail, and so he built the monorail, and the whole deal was going to be a residential home for something like 20,000 people. Now, I'll tell you, now more than 20,000 people at any given time are staying on property at Disney, but I digress. The vision was this very futuristic city where, like, people would come and see what was happening there and take that information home to improve cities around the world, that traffic would not drive on the streets. 
No, people would walk on the streets. All car traffic would be underground. How are you going to do that in a swamp? As we know, really a problem. But that was the idea that you know, this man is from California. He does not, or lives in California, doesn't understand swamp, don't dig, bad. But you were, all of the traffic would be underground so people could walk above ground. It would be modern, super modern industry. And then they would never need to drive except to leave. And why would you want to leave? Because you were going to get around by moder- monorail and people mover. This vision didn't happen. But Epcot, now as a theme park built in the 80s, is a holdover from those ideas. And so you have the World Showcase with the, you know, a dozen nations represented. And you have a thing called the land and a thing called the sea. And they're building a thing called the imagination. And there's all these rides dedicated to space. And up until recently, there wasn't even like Disney characters. Now there's an Anna and Elsa ride and a Guardians of the Galaxy ride. And you can have dinner with Anna and Elsa too. But all of that's new. It used to be a thing called the Spirit of Norway and a weird Mexico ride starring Donald Duck going to Mexico from a cartoon that long predates me. And it was all very nerdy and very strange and still utterly baffling as a theme park that 10 million people last year went to. Because it's a holdover from a vision that just didn't happen. The showcase, the central image of Epcot is the giant geodesic dome, Spaceship Earth, which is not a thrill ride. It's a very slow train ride through the entirety of human history narrated by Lady Judi Dench. Again, you get off of Spaceship Earth and you have to remember, I am at a theme park having fun. This nerdy, I actually really enjoy Epcot, but it is a very nerdy, very weird thing where it is essentially trying to be a world, a permanent world's fair because what Walt really wanted was to build Epcot, experimental prototype, community, or city, use those words interchangeably, of tomorrow. That one didn't work out. But why bring this up on Palm Sunday? So you've got to realize what the triumphal entry actually is. It is Jesus declaring victory before the battle is even started. And it is Jesus showing you what his vision of the future looks like. It is his experimental prototype for the world as it should be. Not what it will look like in a week, right? Where more or less, the timeline gets a little strange at this part of the story, but we are more or less a week out from the resurrection. This is not an image of what the world will look like in a week. This is an image, this is a prototype This is a small instance of what the world will be like in the end of time. This is an image of the world made right. In Bible study uh, in the previous series, and so this is on my mind because I was teaching about this text like a month and a half ago, in Revelation 21 and 22, when you read this vision of tomorrow, this this statement of what all things will look like in God's final victory, it is as important, and the text highlights what is there. Like, Jesus is there. All people, all all the faithful are there. There's water and trees of life and the sun, and it's all beautiful. But it's also important to notice the things that are not there. Bad things are not there, right? Death is not there. Fear is not there. Hunger is not there. Sickness is not there. But also, there is no temple there. The center of the city is not a temple. The center, uh, at least it's not actually geographically how Jerusalem works, but set that aside with me for a second. The centerpiece of Jerusalem 
is the temple. And Jesus is coming from the Mount of Olives, going down through literal hell, um, coming up and going to the temple. That is what he triumphantly enters. Not just the city of, city of Jerusalem, but the temple mount specifically. And that is the center. And it is the epicenter of religious life and thought and the world. Because it is, as we have talked about many times, the God seat, the holy of holies, the place where only a special set of dudes, they were always dudes, not my fault, the special set of dudes had to wear special clothing like they were going to be going to a nuclear containment site and go through a series of protocols similar to getting ready to going into the thing in Chernobyl uh, to be able to enter the Holy of Holies, to make the required sacrifices that only a special dude in special clothing, he was literally tied so he could be pulled back at any moment so he could get close to where God sits on earth. This is a mildly over-dramatized exact statement of how the temple worked. The chief priests put on very special chief priestly garments and went in very cautiously to the presence of God to like Indiana Jones taking an idol, but this time leaving something, making the sacrifices and getting the heck out of there before it gets torched. That was the image of faith. That was the image of the connection between the people and God. It was very mediated. You needed those mediators. God is scary. God should probably still scare us. Not like that, but God should probably still scare you. It's an incredible power. That's what I think I was going to talk about last week. I don't remember. I don't remember much. It was a super mediated relationship. But there are all these levels between you and God. And now, that certainly makes God less scary, but also makes God less, less approachable, and also means that you are not getting the Word of God. You're getting the Word of God sent to you via a game of telephone uh, from the guy that got to go in there. Contrast all that with what happens here. God doesn't get in a gold box. God among us gets on a common beast of burden, the small hatchback or family minivan of the ancient world. It's not even a fancy animal. It's a cult of a donkey. Just, you know, again, the, an ordinary beast of burden that an ordinary tradesperson or farmer, they didn't really have like a middle class, but it's like a middle class family vehicle of the ancient world. It's not on a giant Roman war horse. He's not in a gold box. It's not being carried in one of those litters like people in epic movies in the 1950s. No, he's just riding a donkey with his friend's jackets on it. The guys just take off their ordinary jackets. Folks in those days would have only owned one set of clothes and thus only one jacket. And so these guys who are itinerant rabbis, essentially, have taken off their not all that great smelling garments, put those not great smelling garments on a famously foul smelling animal, and Jesus gets on that and rides into Jerusalem. And the people just celebrate the presence of God. They walk in God's parade. They walk with God. They wave at God. They praise God directly, right there in front of them. And they are joyous. They are shouting Hosanna, right? Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the, co the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. And he makes his way to the temple. But that temple, in that moment, is pointless. Because it's not the place where God is sitting. God is sitting on that donkey. Right there. Among the people. Right there. Where there's no separation from God and God's people. There's no need for a temple. There's no need for mediation. There is no need for the nuclear level protocols for approaching God. You just walked up and waved. 
waved your palm branches, chucked your jacket in the road, and celebrated. Because in, a perf- in the perfect world that is coming, the true nature of the light, the shining of the light, is that God and God's people will no longer be separated by sin and death and pain, no longer separated by mediators of uncertain quality, no longer separated by unbelief, no longer separated physically. We will all be together. And we will know the joy of this moment, this one crystallized moment, is what we will live for eternity. This is what it is to bask in the light of God. As God's light shines and we bask in it, we have this moment where we spontaneously celebrate, and yet we spontaneously celebrate world without end, ah, eterna, amen. This is a vision of that. This is a very brief experimental prototype of the true world of tomorrow. And what happens for the next week is Jesus is doing the work to ensure that, unlike Walt, genius though he may be, was, well, his head has been frozen. He may be back. I don't know. He froze his body. So Walt Disney may well be back, and I've got a lot of questions for him. But we haven't figured out how to do that yet. Right now, he's just a man on ice forever Unlike that, because of what's coming, this will happen. This is where we're going. We tell this as part of the Holy Week story. But it should serve for us the same way that the Last Supper ends up serving for the disciples. The disciples get this, especially in John's Gospel, many different ways for Jesus to talk to them about what exactly is going to happen and what it will be like after and what they are to do. Now, they still don't get it all right, so you're in really good company, but they get this explainer, and the crowd and all of us get this moment of, hey, where is the universe going? What will it all be like? When God's victory comes fully into place, it'll be like all of God's people, spontaneously celebrating, joyously, at the presence of God, the unmediated, direct presence of God in their midst. And we get the emotional content of that moment. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king, coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious loving God, we give you thanks that we get this glimpse of your future where nothing, nothing, separates us. Not our own struggles, not human institutions, not even our age-old enemy, death. That we will get to live in this triumph moment of triumph forever. God, may we see it for what it is. Not just the statement of past events, but a statement, a vision, a prototype, for your future that can be our future. In Jesus' most holy name we pray. Amen.